I can't talk about the mechanism specifically, but um, there, yeah, there you go. Any other questions from the floor? Oh, yes, Sammy. So again, tell us your name and what high school. I'm Sammy, Went to I go to Ballard. Uh, this is for Louise. Uh, can you elaborate on AI and anesthesiology? Yeah, um, so this is a very new field. Just AI in general is a new field in medicine. Uh, so I'll be um, looking at using AI, mainly using something similar as the Microsoft HoloLens. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's kind of like Google lenses, glasses that, that you can, yeah, do you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, and we'll be looking at the use of AI to detect medical errors. Uh, so when an anesthesiology picks up a syringe, or uh, anesthesiologist picks up a syringe, uh, we're hoping that that can detect the volume, concentration, and correct medication that's being delivered to the patient. Everyone knows what AI is? Raise your hands if you do. Great. All right. Artificial intelligence. Testing. Now I have another question. This is directed at Ziad. Um, because you are also, you are a USC alumni. And then I had questions about the research opportunities available because I was planning on double majoring because right now my selected major is neuroscience and I didn't have the option to double major in my application, but I was hoping to double major in neuroscience and biomedical engineering because that's what I'm doing at Highline. And so I was wondering if there are research opportunities within that field or research opportunities for pre-meds in general. There 100% are. Um, so I actually didn't do research when I was at USC. I did it um, when the pandemic hit. I came here, uh, I reached out to Dr. Pierre and Dr. Chapman and got to do research here. But um, you can easily just walk up to a professor. There's a list, um, sort of some sort of like registry where you can see each professor and what project they're working on. And you can email them. I know a lot, of, sort of like cold calls. You're just emailing a bunch of professors. You have to do that. I mean, this field is, like these doctors, these surgeons are so busy, so they're not always going to be available, but one of them is going to hit and you're going to have your opportunity. Um, and so I was doing that during, I got a couple uh, opportunities, but then I decided to come here. So, but yeah, you can definitely reach out and find out. Thank you. This question in the back row. I thought I saw a hand. Let's do some roll call. Yep, there she is. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, this question's for Louise. Uh, I was just wondering how you um, handle just the pressure of being a first generation to go to college, because that's how I am. And I feel like I'm very pressured to do everything so perfectly. So I was just wondering how you handled that and everything you went through. Yeah, so um, I'm not very good at it, uh, but you know well handling the pressure of the it being first generation in my culture firstborn son is sort of supposed to continue on helping your parents and so that's been difficult um but I, I think creating boundaries for me with my parents and my family uh has been helpful i know it's difficult because if we're sort of conditioned to sort of want to help uh, in whatever way we can. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that helps. I, I haven't found a perfect way to do that uh, other than creating those boundaries and, and talking to the, generally they, they don't really, my, my family don't, they don't really know sort of the work that goes into med school, what med school even means. So they're kind of sort of confused as to why I'm always studying and always doing things. Um, but they understand that I'm going to be a doctor, and doctors are important, and it impresses them. So, Akshay, uh, Akshay, can you tell us what a typical day is like of a medical student, since Luis just mentioned? Um, sure. Um, I think 
My, my experience right now with medical school is going to probably be a little bit different. It varies from person to person. Um, but, you know, currently I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, congenital heart research. That's why I'm over at Seattle Children's. And so I'll spend maybe three or four days out of the week going over to the Research Institute over in downtown Seattle um, just so that I can get some more research work done in the mornings, which is from probably around like 8 or 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. or 1 p.m. Um, and then I'll grab a quick bite, um, usually when I'm in, you know, driving or something over um, back to my place, and then I'll take my dogs out. Um, I have two dogs, so I obviously you have to factor in all these other life things, you know, and um, so I take those, my dogs out for like 30 minutes, and then I'll like have a dedicated study period, no distractions, no phone, uh, you know, that's a huge thing. I found that, you know, I'm more efficient and I can really get a lot of work done in, in like maybe a, an hour or two of undistracted time versus like if I spend like maybe four or five hours and I have all those distractions open. Um, and then I'll sometimes watch the recorded lectures. So our school has the op like optional lectures. And so you can attend in person or they have, they record the lecture so that you can watch them at your own convenience. Mm -hmm. And so for my schedule, it works for me to be able to watch them at my own time later in the evening, um, just to see if there are any details that I might have missed uh, during my first kind of skim of material. Um, and so that affords me the freedom to kind of, you know, take care of all the other life stuff, like cooking dinner, or sometimes I'll like cook and I'll watch a lecture on the side. Um, and so, so that I can have time to do other things too. And so it's kind of how I manage my time. It's just trying to find pockets of time where I can do multiple things at once. Mm -hmm. um, and then also realizing how I learn best. Um, and sometimes going to lecture, I get distracted by, you know, my, some of my peers and things like that. And so I like to just, you know, just kind of sit down with the material by myself and kind of work things through at my own pace um, and then come back to the material later in a like, lecture format. Yes. Uh, so first of all, Akshay is one of the, mo the smartest people I know. Uh, we're, we go to the same school, same year. So you should listen to what he says. Um, but also, just to go back to the recorded lectures, I know it sounds kind of fun. You're kind of thinking, oh, I can just not go to class. And, mo and, and most med schools have sort of switched to this model. So I will say that it's a flipped classroom. And for those of you that are familiar with that is, you're sort of required to learn everything on your own. So during that time that you're not going to lecture, you are studying and you are, it's quite a bit of studying. Uh, and then when you go to class, you're just sort of reviewing that material. Like I said, it's not just at UW, it's med schools across the country. So I, I don't even know if I mentioned this, which is pretty crazy, but I'll be uh, attending Wake Forest in North Carolina uh, come July. So I can't speak on my med school experience, but in high school, in college, for me, lectures, it's very hard for me to like understand while the lecturer is speaking because I'll get hooked on something that he said or he, or he or she said before. And then I'm like trying to fixate on that and then they just keep going and then you lose a lot of information. So for me, I think post pandemic, the recordings of the lectures is super helpful. That's just one way, but you can also go to lectures too. So there's, there's a lot more versatility in how you can study and um, how you can be efficient as a student. So. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, we have two. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this question is directed towards Sydney, but anyone who wants to answer this question is free to answer it. But as someone who is um, deeply interested in chemical engineering, I love chemistry, and I think that it can really change the world. What is your biggest challenge that you faced while uh, rising to your level? I like the way you phrase that, rising to your level. OK, <laughs> yes, we have risen. Um, <laughs> um, so just first off, yay for chemical engineering. Um, so chemical engineers, we don't do chemistry, but we use chemistry. So chemistry is a tool that we use. But we are kind of figuring out how to make things exist that maybe don't naturally come to exist in that way. So we really like design a lot of processes. Um, and in my case, the process I'm designing is getting medicine into the brain. Um, what was the question? Oh, big, yes, in, in the rising, yeah, I got, I got on that. Okay, so I think, um, and you know, we share a lot of identities. So 
this might be something y'all have experienced too. So I was like very much like, oh my gosh, get into STEM. Like we need you in STEM, we need you in STEM. And I was like, okay, so I'm in the STEM classes. And then it was really hard. And no one told me it was hard. And people weren't telling me it was hard. Like the other students were kind of fronting a little bit. And so I really thought it was just me. And I, I had kind of internalized a lot. And like, I wasn't really seeking a lot of resources because I was like, oh, I actually don't belong here, all this kind of stuff. And then at the end of the course, everyone's like, woo, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. I can't imagine how I got through that. And I was like, oh, oh, so, I just want it to be known that it is hard. It's not just you, but it is okay that it is hard because you will rise and you will get better and you will be able to do it. But just, I think we don't, we kind of sugarcoat the difficulty a little bit. And so it, it might shock you. And then again, like it's not, there's nothing wrong with you. It is just hard, <laughs> but you'll be able to get there. I feel like I'm just piggybacking off your guys' questions. Um, so to that point, she said she walked in, she thought it was hard, nobody else said it was hard. But the biggest error that you can make is comparing yourself to others. And this is not just in medicine, this is in life. And this is something I used to always do. I'm like, how is this person understanding this? I just, it's just, not, I'm not comprehending it at all. And then I got to organic chemistry where everyone says that's the hardest class you'll ever take in college, aced it. So like that for me was the easiest class and then the, the biology course that everybody loved and was so interesting to them, I thought that was really hard. So like everybody's experience is gonna be totally different. You might be better at something that somebody else is not very good at and then vice versa. So just don't compare, I didn't have a quote on mine but that would be my quote, don't compare yourself to others. That's a good one. One more, one last question before we do roll call. Oh, okay, two more questions then we'll do roll call. Remember to uh, state your name and what high school? Uh, I'm Sammy, I went to Ballard. It's for Akshay. You mentioned uh, shadowing. I just wonder how you do that. Like, Yeah, absolutely. I can speak to that. So, yeah, so just going to preface it by saying, like, no one in my family was, like, connected to, like, medicine at all. And so it was, like, hard to rely on previous connections. So I had to go out and put myself out there. So I'd cold call. This was in, like, sophomore year of my high school. I'd cold call hospitals um, and be like, hey, like, would it be possible to shadow X and X, you know, physician that's, like, you know, operating or, you know, uh, practicing at your hospital? And then they send me their email address. So I'd, like, have, like, 20 email addresses. And then I just, you know, cold email all of them just to see if one of them would hit because all you need is that one yeah. right um, and so that the, the one that hit was an orthopedic surgeon and so that kind of first experience really stuck with me um, and so I think like the biggest thing is just not being afraid to just put yourself out there and to reach out and the worst thing that can happen is you maybe get a reject, like a, a no or maybe a no response, but all it takes is that one response to really get you in there and, and to see if that's something that you are passionate about, something that you'd enjoy doing. Okay. Uh, one last question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica and I go to Rainier Beach High School. My question is for Sydney. Um, first off, I just want to say your story is very inspirational and it gave me a better outlook on the medical field. As a first gen, my parents does not support me pursuing in the medical field, and I was wondering what advice can you give me to help my situation? I would say first, um, finding community. So look here, connect with these people and let some of these people be your community. I have really leaned on, like, because I mean, we share some like similar identities. Like our families don't quite understand what it is that we do, and they don't quite understand why we're so busy and why we can't come home and all these kinds of things. So really, having people that understand that and can kind of rally beside you is helpful. Having mentors, find mentor; those can be helpful too. And then also kind of holding on to why you want to do this. Like I had actually, someone told me that at the beginning of my PhD. They're like, you're going to forget when you get in the weeds, why you got here in the first place. So write it down. And so I have a document, my why, why I did this. And when I start to forget, I look at that document. And the days that I feel inspired, I add to that document. You know, And so just continuously reminding yourself, um, like it's not gonna replace kind of the things that you're experiencing, but it can help support you and help build you back up, if that helps. Thank you. I think that's a great way to end that session. Let's uh, thank all our uh, panelists.
So uh, we're going to do a little stretching of our legs, do roll call. So Garfield High, stand up, please. Oh, this is a little stretch, stretch. I was like, this roll call. OK. Again, thank you for coming down block um, to join us. Uh, all right, you may, you may be seated. Don't forget to put your name tags on. Uh, I heard Rainier Beach is in the house. You could stand up. Rainier Beach, rep, rep your school, rep your school. Okay, uh, we have, we have uh, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is your community. We mentioned Ballard. Okay, stand up. Nice, nice. Um, Highline, Highline, no? Oh, okay, okay. All right, all right. Bremerton? All right, I, I see. I, I got the same shirt. I got the same shirt. Purple Rain, Prince. Um, did I miss any other schools? Mount Rainier. Okay, okay. <laughs> any others? Awesome. So a, a couple housekeeping. We do have the restrooms here to the right, right behind, uh, right uh, heading towards the dining room. Um, we're going to start with our next panel. Uh, we are going to have one physician calling in from Zoom. Uh, so again, thank our panelists for the first session. Appreciate you. Thanks. Okay. Great. And um, uh, so uh, the next session, it was my idea now to say, okay, we do this in steps. After high school, you go to college. From college, you go to medical school. So all these or graduate school. Uh, after that, you enter residency, fellowship, into your careers and training, whatever specialties you might choose to do. Uh, so I have uh, uh, some uh, specialists from different fields. I would ask them to come forward. We can have them take a seat uh, here for those who are here. I see Dr. Terry. I see Melissa. I see Anthony. Um, uh, Dr. Nwosu is going to sign in through Zoom, and Ben will help us with that. Anyone else? Uh, are we going to pass it around? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Dr. Rose, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you were hiding back there. I was like, wait, wait, what's going on? I don't know if uh, Dr. Williams I made it. Do. I know her. That's okay. <laughs> okay, we got Dr. Nwosu. Is Dr. Williams in the building? Dr. Tolbert? And then I think Greg will join us. So uh, I'll have uh, um, Dr. Terry come forward. She's going to moderate this section. Um, again, uh, we'll start with a PowerPoint uh, where each person will kind of share two to three minutes of their story. And then I will open it up for questions throughout. Um, and is, is if Dr. Abdul Jabbar is available, he can join us as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Dr. Terry. You, oh, you can be where you can, yeah, you can stay. Yeah, you, you have a mic. Uh, can we get her a mic? Okay, yeah, yeah. Come on. okay, great. Good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Peter. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Michelle Terry. I'm a, a pediatrician. I work at Seattle Children's and I take care of children who are on our complex care program. So meaning kids who are a little sicker um, at baseline than um, the, you know, average kid. Um, I also work at the University of Washington School of Medicine where I am in the Office of Faculty Affairs and I'm an assistant dean for faculty who are early career, who identify, self-identify as underrepresented in medicine and science. So it's a bit of a cohort to kind of, you know, get faculty who might be all over the big UW Medicine together at least once a month to talk about um, things that early career faculty need to know about, like, you know, career development topics, negotiation, conflict resolution, um, the difference from being uh, busy and being productive, things like that. Um, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I knew I wanted to be a doctor when I was in middle school, and so I kind of had that eye on the prize all the way through. I um, uh, ended up going to uh, Stanford University for my undergraduate degree, 
and I'm still in touch with many of my um, friends from my pre-med cohort there. We met um, in New Orleans last week, and I had a, a picture with a three friends who are pediatricians and they're all named Leslie and then me. So I was like, one of these things is not like the other, although we're all pediatricians. Um, and then I went back home to my hometown of Houston, Texas um, um, to complete my medical degree. And then I saw uh, Seattle on the news, um, well, um, during a Final Four game, actually. There's not a venue here big enough to have a Final Four anymore, but it was around this time, and I said, oh, I think I'd like to move to Seattle. So, so that's what I did for residency. And I got really interested in some other topics along the way, medical education and advocacy and policy and regulations. And so I've been active with the uh, King County Medical Society and was president of that for the previous two years. And I'm really um, um, active with the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, so that's how we advocate for kids, you know, making sure kids have all the things they need to thrive in addition to um, uh, health, education, nutrition, um, uh, housing, environmental stuff. And um, I am also uh, have a partner, my husband, Ken, and I've been married a long time and have three kids, um, the youngest of who's in college now. So with that, um, it's really great to meet all of you all. I'm happy to, to talk to you about anything that you like. And our esteemed panel, I have some questions prepared for them as well. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Anthony. Yeah, me first. Yeah, uh, my name's uh, Anthony Dixon, Jr. Um, I am a x-ray tech, and I work downstairs in um, interventional radiology. Uh, a little bit about my story. Uh, first generation high school or college graduate. Um, Chief Self, 2009, go Seahawks. Okay. Heard a couple other Seattle schools, Metro schools in here. Uh, I went to Bellevue College. I got my AA, and then I got into the... <clears throat> The radiology tech program in 2013, which is another associate's program, another two years, 2015, graduated. Born and raised in Seattle. A couple of my passions, my family, I have a wife, those are my kids down there. Um, traveling, grilling, and learning. If it doesn't change you, or if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. Excellent. Thank you. And, um, Hi, can, okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm an occupational therapist here at Swedish Cherry Hill. Um, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and then I went to Pitt for undergrad and grad school. My undergrad was in psych, and then I pursued a, a master's in occupational therapy program at Pitt as well under um, a K. Leroy Arvis Fellowship, so that was very nice. Um, allowed me a lot of research opportunities specifically related to stroke rehabilitation and self-awareness. Um, my previous work settings as an occupational therapist included working at a skilled nursing facility, which is a bit of a lower intensity therapy setting, um, working in an outpatient hands and pediatric clinic. So one day of the week it was all hands therapy and the other days it was outpatient peds. And then uh, the research assistant and recruiter was primarily done at uh, Pitt. And now at Swedish Cherry Hill, it is a complete, it's primarily a neuro setting. So that is the population that we, we really serve. I don't know if you all are familiar with occupational therapy. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Majority or a little bit? Okay, for, so a little few hands. So just to kind of orient you, occupational therapy is primarily like just trying to help people be as safe and independent with their self care. So if you think about when you get up first thing in the morning, you have to get out of bed and get to brush your teeth and get yourself dressed and go to the bathroom. If somebody were to have a stroke or brain cancer or any type of heart condition, I would be the one to help them learn how to do those things for themselves with weakness and stamina issues and balance issues so that they can be a little bit more independent. And if they can't, teaching their caregivers on how to help them, caregivers meaning loved ones. Um, outside of work, I like to do stand-up paddleboarding, reading, fitness, and I'm um, hanging out with my husband and dog. Thank you. Thank you.
I am uh, Dr. Rhodes. Um, just quick shout out again to all my GSH students that are here. Yes. <laughs> I really appreciate you all um, getting up extra early to be at school at 815 this morning. So kudos to you all. Um, I am a registered nurse, um, been a nurse um, in August. It'll be 18 years. Um, I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. Go Ohio Buckeyes, yes. Um, <laughs> I went to Clark Atlanta University um, and then went to Ursuline College um, is where I got my um, bachelor's in science and nursing. Um, been a professor at Green River College, um, Renton Tech. Um, I did work at DSHS um, and other numerous jobs that I've had over the 17 plus years. Um, and currently, again, I am at Garfield and I teach, um, I'm in the CTE program there. So I will, I am teaching family health and intro to med right now. And then um, next year I will be doing physiology, also home care aid, in addition to the other courses. Um, I also teach um, the um, asynchronous BSN program at PLU. So I do that online um, as well currently. Um, my interests are skating, um, watching movies with my family. Um, I love basketball, I love football, um, and I like doing community service. And so my quote <coughs> is actually one of my own because I often get asked um, from my students a lot, especially my nursing students, how do I do the, what I do? And I just tell them I don't ask myself how I'm going to do something, I just do it. Because when I ask myself how, I am subconsciously adding doubt. So I'm pouring in my head why I can't do it. So I don't ask myself how, I just do it. So for all of you all, do the same thing. Because it might seem like it's a lot of piled up on your plate, or you got to do this, you got to do that. Some of you, I know some of my students work and go to school. Um, sometimes it's not by choice, it's by must and need. So um, just keep telling yourself, I can do it, and don't ask yourself how, and just, just do it. Thanks. I'm going to pass the mic. Uh, uh, <laughs> lots of choices. Hello, everyone. My name is Gerald Tolbert. Um, I'm an emergency, medics, um, emergency medicine physician by training. Um, so I can, I'll can. i just peruse through the slide here. So um, born in New York, only one of my mom's five kids that was born outside the state of Florida. So um, I get to pick all of the New York teams you know, and root against uh, the Florida teams. Um, and uh, Lakeland, Florida is where I'm from. Not a lot going on there. Secondary to that, I uh, joined the United States Navy out of high school. I did two tours overseas in the Gulf War. Um, that taught me a lot about myself. It taught me a lot about how little I needed to survive. And subsequently, I said, peace. And I got out, stayed in the reserves because it was a good side hustle. Um, and it was fun serving with the guys. And um, I went to community college, Southwestern Community College, started out there, um, which is where I started my passion for judo. I'm a judoka, I'm a black belt. Um, as a matter of fact, my son and I are gonna go uh, compete in the tournament this weekend after I leave here. So um, I, after community college, I went to UCSD for undergrad. Um, uh, through that whole process, I learned that any, I don't know if any of you've heard of MESA, Math, Engineering, Science, Achievement. Uh, but I was a MESA student, became, I did a lot of work with MESA. I love that program. It focuses a lot, at least back then, on underrepresented students, uh, which is a passion of mine as mm -hmm. being one, being first generation, um, first college, first of all, all things. And uh, went back to school uh, after undergrad and working at, for, at a program called EAOP. I don't know if anyone's, that's really a California thing, by the way. Uh, but it really, it's a, it works in K through 12 education. It's just working with students, helping uh, students figure out what their college requirements are, how do you get into school, all of the things. I ran a big tutoring program, about 120 undergrads. We went everywhere, Native American reservations, uh, local community, um, local com um, high schools um, from the border uh, throughout all of ca um, um, Southern California. I uh, went back to school after all that, after meeting my wife, and uh, you know, I never lost a bug from medical school. 
And uh, she said to me, I don't care what you do. I don't want to hear about it in 20 years. So uh, I took that to heart. I uh, went to Wayne State for medical school, Detroit. Uh, it was a great place to train. Great. Um, it, was, it was one of the coolest experiences ever because there was a fairly decent group of underrepresented students there, which is not the experience I've had in most settings. I don't know about all of you. Um, residency at UIC. And um, so that's why it's complicated. Where do I call home? So I'm now here at, uh, at uh, UW, uh, and um, my interests are um, health equity. Um, I work in medical student education. I am the foundations dean for Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, which means I oversee the first two years of the medical school program, all of the support aspects of it at Seattle. We are five state medical schools, six foundation sites. I could go on. I will try to keep this brief. Uh, and I'm also uh, the assistant dean for student support, so I oversee um, our telehealth, uh, our uh, basically health and wellness, and as, as well as service learning. So service learning is, you know, service, giving back to others. Great part of my job. We do a lot of work at tiny house villages. I volunteer my time to go in and provide free health care at tiny house villages. Do you guys know what that is? Tiny house villages? Have you ever heard of them? No? Nope? Okay. So a few people out there. Okay, so it's it was it's great volunteering. Um, other things, me familia. Um, that was a family reunion over there uh, quite a few years ago, but it's still one of my favorite things. And then just travel. Um, that was in um, Venice, actually. Uh, uh, it's the place is underwater for the most part, so everything is done by boat. Thank you. So thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks for your service. We got one more. Uh, we have uh, actually a couple more. So oh, Greg, awesome. and then we have Dr. Inwosu, who's going to be on Zoom, and Dr. Williams says he's on his way as well. So, sure. hello, my name is Greg Jimenez. I'm a physician assistant in uh, in cardiology. I probably work in uh, with interventional cardiology uh, practice with um, my attending uh, uh, physician Peter Demopoulos, who specializes in uh, placing uh, stents in the heart, uh, PFO closures, uh, pacemaker placements. Um, I've been a physician assistant since 2009. Uh, I went to the University of Washington for PA school. Um, but prior to that, I was, uh, I was in the Army. I was a combat medic. Um, I got tired of, uh, of getting shot at and uh, sleeping on the ground and carrying my food with me, so I decided to go back to school. <laughs> it was the best decision ever, but yeah. Um, I, I, this, uh, the picture down there, everyone says my dog looks like Stitch. Uh, so this is Kekoa. He's my second uh, French Bulldog. I, uh, I lost my uh, first one, um, uh, Chancho, in, uh, about two years ago and finally made a leap to get another one after healing. Anyway, but he's amazing. Um, but uh, um, I enjoy, well, I'm, I'm also a grappler, so I enjoy a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've been um, doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for about 10 years now. Um, and so uh, it's a great way to uh, relieve stress after a long day. Um, but yeah, that's what I do. So you and Dr. Tobert's gonna go at it today? <laughs> oh, um, I'm gonna pull guard. I'm not letting him throw me. <laughs> gotcha. Um, Dr. Nwosu, are you still with us? I am. Can you hear me okay? Uh, can you hear me okay? <laughs> can we hear him? Um, I'm still here, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, and I also have your slide up if Ben wants to do a dual screen. Thank you. Perfect. Hey, uh, Dr. Pierre, thanks for having me. And um, I apologize, I can't be there in person. I'm, I'm on call currently. And I think, you know, it may be worthwhile to explain um, to the audience what that means. So um, I'm, a, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon, and I'm, I'm covering call for um, all of multi-care health system. So that's about 10 hospitals. So if anyone injures their spine or has an infection in their spine or has a significant spine complaint, I get called. So I've gotten about like uh, 25 calls this morning already. Um, so um, uh, being on call is something that, you know, a, a lot of us physicians have to do. And that's the reason why I can't be there today. So I apologize. Um, so, so again, I'm Ken Nwosu. I'm an ortho spine surgeon. Um, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, moved out to the United States, uh, Southern California, when I was about 12. Um, I uh, uh, attended high school there, and um, I played quite a bit of football, and I, I um, went to University of uh, 
uh, Texas, Austin on a football scholarship. I was there for a couple of years and then uh, came back to Cal State University, San Bernardino um, and did some medical missions and um, became interested in service um, uh, through healthcare. Um, I went to UCLA for med school, uh, UCLA for residency and uh, did my fellowship at, in Harvard um, in spine surgery. Um, and then I got recruited to come to Seattle. They, they told me that, that the cost of living and the traffic was pretty low here. Um, and, I, and I found out the hard way that that wasn't the case, but so far so good. Um, I love it. Um, and um, what do I do for fun? Love to travel, um, you know, do things to stay in shape. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big foodie. And um, yeah, I just I just believe in, in doing hard things, um, always kind of being out of your comfort zone. Um, so cold plunging, fasting, weird stuff like that. Um, uh, I, I, I enjoy those things. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we, we, we do have Dr. Abdul Jabbar on, on, on standby in person if you get called away. So we, we thank you for that. And again, Dr. Abdul Jabbar could just share a couple of words of background of his story, and then we'll have Dr. Terry open it up for questions. Yeah, as I mentioned before, I'm originally from uh, Los Angeles. I came up here for fellowship, um, did my medical school down at LSU in New Orleans, it was a great place to live. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to stay on the team here. You know, we train fellows. Um, so for those of you who don't know kind of how it works in the orthopedic training world, um, you know, you go to med school, you know you want to be a doctor. That's only the beginning. Um, you decide to be an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, that's still only the beginning. Most of us specialize in something else. So um, we train both neurosurgery fellows and orthopedic fellows uh, who want to focus on spine. So um, we do nothing but spine surgery, and uh, there's still, you know, still learning all the time. Uh, we put courses on here for people who specialize in spine um, that are spine surgeons and want to learn new techniques. Um, I really believe that the kind of world up here, uh, you know, is just kept me really sharp um, because I'm learning all the time and uh, it's very easy to get kind of stuck in a routine um, if you're isolated. And uh, I think the education piece has really kept me uh, continuing learning um, and, and still interested in uh, becoming a better surgeon all the time. So, um, you know, I really, uh, you know, give that tribute to my partners up on the screen and then uh, the fellows that come through uh, every year that are, you know, trying to become spine surgeons for, uh, you know, it's a kind of a two way street, you know, we're teaching them, but they're also teaching us all the time. So uh, just a really great opportunity to be able to be here in Seattle and, and work with the Seattle Science Foundation. So, Thank you. Um, you know, I, I uh, live up here in the area, um, you know, I have two young daughters, um, you know, my partner and I, we just, it's been such a, a blessing to be here. Um, she's from Maple Valley, and so it's kind of, uh, this is my new home, and um, we love doing outdoorsy stuff. You know, being uh, here, we're in uh, Issaquah, and, um, you know, right in the foothills of the Cascades, uh, being able to go uh, mountain biking and hiking, uh, some of the things that I love. So, um, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, looks like we have... Look Looks like we have a theme going. We're going to keep the orthopedic theme going. And then uh, after that, Dr. Terry will uh, take over the Q&A part. So Dr. Williams, without further ado, just a few minutes to share your story in the background. Sorry, I'm late, everyone. I was just uh, in clinic. Um, I wish I would have seen uh, how long you went for, or I guess, but I'll just kind of go through this a little bit. Yeah, and. Fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm Dr. Pierre. I'm Cliff Pierre. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. So, so we've emailed, but I've we have, not met we you in have, person yeah. before. So no, thanks for responding to nice the call. To yeah, so just a few minutes to kind of yeah. share your story, and then afterwards, Dr. Terry's going to open up the whole panel for questions. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, well, this is great. So, yeah, my name is Carlos Williams. Uh, I am, was born in Dominican Republic. Yeah. So I saw, I saw your slide. I am, and yep. <laughs> you young people, I don't know if you know Dominican Republic and Haiti share an island. It's called mm -hmm. Hispaniola. Yeah. When, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue 1492. That's where he went. Um, but yeah, so um, I lived uh, there for six months and then I lived in France until I was seven and then lived uh, in New York where um, a lot of Dominican people live. Uh, training, I did uh, university at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. 
uh, did chemical engineering there at uh, medical school and residency at Howard. <clears throat> Interesting, this is very funny. I didn't, I, wouldn't, I didn't put that there, but I graduated Howard in uh, 2016. When I uh, left, I matched into neurosurgery, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, I, and I spent two years at um, Montefiore. Yep. Yeah. With a gentleman named the Eugene Bronx. Flam, yeah, um, Flam and, yep, Bronx, uh, yeah. Bronx, yep, Gun Hill Road, and I did two years of that. And um, I commend you. I commend all you folks, uh, the neurosurgery folks. I, my path took uh, took me outside of uh, neurosurgery, and then went back to Howard for orthopedics. Finished in 2017, and then fellowship in uh, at Lenox Hill in, in New York City. Well, fellowship is a, is a little special training you can do after your residency. Uh, so orthopedics is just a general uh, field where people, you know, there are some spine surgeons in orthopedics and uh, sports surgeons that do ACL surgeries and things like that. But I specialize in hip and knee replacements. Um, and then for interest, uh, family, travel, hiking, woodworking a little bit, volunteering. And these, this picture down here at the bottom right is a picture I had, I had from uh, Ethiopia. I've gone there a couple years in a row to operate on people to, to do hip replacements. So that's something that's very satisfying and rewarding. Um, and uh, let's see, what, what else do you have there? And then here on the left, bottom left, oh, sorry about that. Um, you all, uh, I don't know how much you all know, but Howard is a special place, special place. And that picture is taken at Howard uh, with some notable people in orthopedics. It's the gentleman in the uh, suit there, uh, Dr. Epps, uh, one of the uh, very uh, prominent uh, leaders in orthopedics in his yeah. time. And the quote that I want to share with you all was actually when I matched into neurosurgery from Howard, uh, they interviewed me for the school paper because it had been a while before somebody matched there and they asked me for a quote and that's what I said. I, don't, I, I couldn't find where I got it from and I've seen variations of how that's uh, phrased, but you know, don't be afraid of failure, just avoid it at all costs. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. So Dr. Terry will take over and uh, open up the floor to question, Dr. Terry. And uh, uh, we'll be also mindful Dr. Nwosu is on so we can ask some questions too. All righty. Well, thank you very much and welcome to this auspicious panel. Yeah. It's so inspiring for everyone to be here. So thank you. I have about 10 questions prepared, so I'm going to combine them a bit and maybe two or three of our panelists can answer each question. So there'll be some room um, at the end for our uh, student audience to ask questions <coughs> that you've come up with. Uh, on your own. Yes. So the first uh, question is, what inspired you to be, to pursue a career in healthcare? And then just tell us about your day. What's a typical day-to-day -day, uh, activities for you in, in, your, um, in your job? Uh, so what inspired me to be in healthcare? Uh, so when I was real young, I had severe asthma. So I spent a lot of time in the hospital. Um, as I got into high school and, you know, getting ready to graduate and stuff, I still had really no idea what I wanted to do. Um, to be honest, I wasn't a real great high school student. Like, I just, I just made it happen. I, I wanted to play basketball, so um, I maintained that GPA to get me, to get me eligible to play. And then um, I just went to Bellevue College, uh, something similar to this, and uh, the x-ray program was brought to my attention. So I, I went into it. Healthcare kind of found me, and I was I was open to it because I was I was comfortable in the hospital, I guess, because I spent a lot of time here. Um, so that's that's kind of that's kind of what happened. I was just kind of open open to to new things, and and um, I just I just wanted to, I wanted to do something that that my family hadn't done before, my my sisters hadn't done before. Um, so ended up ended up going to the X-ray program. Mm -hmm. Um, worked there for a couple years, and then as I got into it, I found different different career paths, and I went into what's called interventional radiology. Um, that's where I met Dr. Pierre, um, and, and I love it. I, I, actually, I, I love it. We impact people's lives. We help people who are in need. Um, I think you talked about people with stroke. Um, so people with stroke is what, who we treat most often, and um, they can be really affected by it. So it's nice to be able to have an impact in their life and feel like you're, you're helping somebody in need. Um, a typical day for me is just like this. I feel kind of dressed down actually, or underdressed. <laughs> <laughs> just dressed. I just, good, I, was, uh, I was downstairs and, um, and working and I, and I just came up to, to do this. But a typical day for me, I work in a, what's called a procedural unit. So we have a, 
we do procedures throughout the day. Um, yeah, I work I work an hourly schedule, so I'm seven to five thirty. Um, we've met, or you guys have met, a lot of people up here that um, have a lot of different roles. So healthcare is multifaceted, multidisciplinary. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I work an hourly shift. I, I do on call schedules as, as well. Like I worked yeah. last night until about ten p.m. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so I was on call yesterday. Thankfully, I'm not on call this weekend. My son has a basketball tournament, so I'll be happy to be there. Uh, so yeah, it, it can range from from very busy to to, to not a lot going on. But um, at any at any point, you got to be ready to to jump into action, and um, that's that's one of the things I think I like most about about this about this job. Uh, so for me, I remember taking a psych class in high school and being really fascinated, specifically by the neuro chapter of it. And so I told myself I was going to pursue neuroscience when I got to undergrad, started taking bio and chem classes, and I was like, oh, this isn't for me. I like more social sciences rather than natural. So I pursued a psych degree. And then afterwards, um, with just a psych degree, there's very limited things you can do with that. So a higher degree is typically needed. So I had a job that actually exposed me to a family that had a lot of children with uh, special needs, but all these children had a lot of early intervention services coming into the home. So it allowed me exposure to OT, PT, speech, vision, auditory, all these different rehab sciences. And so I knew I wanted to do healthcare, but I knew I didn't really want to pursue the med school path. And so this was a really great way for me personally to pursue like working with people and you know being able to treat them throughout the course of their you know whatever they're recovering from so you know a pediatric plan of care is going to be different than a hand plan of care different from you know somebody recovering from a knee surgery and neuro etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so that's how i got here and then um, a typical day-to-day -day for me is you know i come in shift starts early uh, the morning sessions are typically spent training people and teaching them different strategies on how to take care of themselves, like how do you get your shirt on when one of your arms isn't working, or how do you get to the toilet when you're cognitive, you have a cognitive impairment and you don't know how to sequence taking steps, like how do we get you the equipment that you need for home because you can't step over the tub, so you need a different type of equipment to get in so you can take care of yourself or your loved one can take care of you. And after, if once we uh, kind of decide on those kinds of things, we work on the fundamental skills that you need to be able to do those things. So it could be neuromuscular re-education, it could be balance, activity tolerance, whatever. Um, and then that just kind of takes us throughout the entire, the entire shift. And then we get to do it all over again. And I just have a team of people that I work with for about three to four weeks until they're ready to kind of go home with their loved ones. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay, so um, always a tough question. Is um, I, I for whatever reason when I was in middle school, I I, I was fascinated with my pediatrician. Was always kind of curious about what that looks like. I remember interviewing my pediatrician, which was kind of funny. Um, but um, okay, again, being first gen, I I I, I took good, um, for the most part all of the right coursework in high school. But it was more or less by accident. It wasn't because I was getting any guidance. I saw my guidance counselor twice when I was in high school, and I was accused of stealing something from the same person. So um, that was my experience. Um, then I, I, I uh, met my first black physician, or, or probably physician of color, actually in high school, my senior year. It happened to be my prom date. Didn't realize that. <laughs> um, and so, but um, something about going to college, I love science, I just, I don't know, it just was always unique, interesting to me at least. Um, I, I, I was really natural, some parts of it. Uh, what I didn't realize is how many things I didn't get right just because I didn't have a formal like plan, a training process to go through. Um, like taking all of the right coursework, balancing everything out, realizing what was important, what was and what's not important. So anyway, after the, again, after the military, I'm like, you know, what? I'm out of here. I can do I can go to college, uh, started out biochem did, uh, and then work my way through that. I love that work. I love working with young people. I love working and giving students opportunities to at least go to college. Uh, did a lot of that work. And then um, I stayed hungry because I was at a university. So working at a university really was positive for me not, you know, um, losing my goal. 
uh, because I was always around people who were who um, were doing their thing. So I'm working with all of these undergrads and like they're going off to medical school, they're going off to, they're getting their masters in education. They're all doing their thing. So I'm like, well, Gerald, when are you gonna do your thing, right? So um, that's really what inspired me. And then uh, again, meeting my spouse, find, you gotta find people who are invested in you and who actually are saying, hey, you can do this and are gonna support you. Regardless of what area of medicine you go into, if this is not your jam or if you don't have a family history of this, it's hard. So how do you get the right people in front of you to help? Well, that's all about finding people who can be your champions and can be your mentors around this space. And I found champions, I found mentors. And then uh, I you know, was fortunate to get into Wayne State and uh, uh, other schools, whatever, and went there, did that thing for four years. It was great, hard. It's always gonna be maybe a little bit more challenging it, when people say, you know what, um, I'm not sure I can do it. I said, you know, I, again, perseverance, figuring out a way to get through, figuring out a way to get help um, is one of the key things to being successful. What my day looks like now, um, I do two things. I'm an emergency medicine physician. How many of you know about that? Okay. Can anyone give me, give me some things that you think an emergency medicine physician might do? Go ahead, please. Yes, they're very good. You know that. So I see patients, you know, um, I was, it, whoever comes through the door, you pick up the chart and you don't know what you're gonna see. You know, it might be a stroke person, you know, um, so you may be given meds for stroke. It may be someone who's having acute MI. You might be, which is a, a heart attack, excuse me, uh, for my medical lingo. Uh, someone might be having a heart attack. It may be someone uh, who has a skin infection or maybe someone who's really sick or kidney failure, whatever. So all of these different things. So that's what I do and they come in and I figure out what's wrong with them and get them, either admit them to the hospital or get them to a surgeon um, and whatever that needs to, whatever needs to happen, that's what my job is. And I love that part of my job, but the other part of my job, again, is administrative and working with in medical student education. Big focus on underrepresented students or students who need additional help. That's where I draw my energy from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tolbert. I appreciate this. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Wilson, online, please, because we might get called away because you're on call. So thank you so much for, for joining us today, and I really appreciate that. How do you stay updated with the latest advancements and trends in healthcare? Um, uh, thank you for that question. Um, you, you know, Seattle Science Foundation um, has been amazing, um, like, like Dr. Amir Abdul-Jabbar uh, alluded to. Um, uh, you know, I, I log on to Seattle Science Foundation often looking for different topics that that are interesting to me or different topics that my knowledge may be a bit shaky on. Um, you know, I, I read the journals. Um, typically, you know, there are journals for each, um, you know, peer review journals for each subspecialty that are published on a monthly basis um, where, where there are studies um, uh, that you can review. Um, so I do those. I also do uh, uh, attend meetings. Good good opportunity to learn and have some fun at the same time. Um, so oftentimes there are meetings in different states, sometimes out of the country. Um, um, you know, personally, I, I myself, I host a meeting um, uh, called the Mazama Spine Summit, and um, uh, Dr. Dr. Abdul Jabbar has attended a few times um, where we have dialogues on the latest and greatest in spine surgery. Um, there's also a medical legal component um, uh, to that meeting as well, um, as well as um, updates in tech. Um, so I would say primarily uh, peer review journals, um, uh, Seattle Science Foundation and um, uh, conferences locally and, and, and um, you know, within the United States and outside the United States. I, thank you so much. That's really, really helpful. So it's lifelong learning, y'all. 
um, you know, you get your degrees and then you continue to do continuing medical education uh, every uh, week for practically the rest of your life. And because we're a licensed profession, um, the regulatory body tells us how much CME we have to do. And so in Washington, physicians have to do at least 50 hours a year of continuing medical education. So that's at least an hour a week um, of, um, of additional study after your degree. So thank you. Alrighty, would anyone um, like to answer? Um, can you describe a particularly memorable or impactful experience you've had while working in healthcare? Um, a memorable experience for me was when I was working for the Cuyahoga County Board of Health and um, I was a welcome home mom. And so what that, what that means is I go to homes to moms who just delivered um, babies and I do a quick assessment on the mom, assessment on the baby, do some education. And so I get to this home and I notice that this mother doesn't have a working stove. Um, she's using a hot plate basically um, to kind of keep meals for her, her kids. She had kids ranging from um, teenage all the way down to newborn, and they just had one mattress on the floor. So all of them were sleeping on the mattress, and there was a cooler for her to keep stuff cold, but she was going to the convenience store because there really wasn't a grocery store in her neighborhood that she could access. And so, um, I knew that we had a program that would help um, with some of those needs. And so I applied for that mom to get some um, bedding and um, some beds and some other things for her family. And um, she didn't have a way, she got approved. She didn't have a way to get it. At the time I had a um, F-150 pickup truck. So I went myself and brought all that stuff, packed up all the beds and mattresses onto my um, truck, and I took it to her. Um, and we also do these things where I had to do an Edinburgh um, scale on her, which is basically kind of like a mini psych test to see how the mom's doing, if she's got high levels of postpartum depression, and she scored extremely high. Um, so we stayed in contact, um, and some months later, she reached out to me. And she said her life was doing much better. Um, she was on her feet um, and it was just, she thanked me so much for doing that for her family because that really had a positive impact. So for me, I didn't do it for the accolades. Um, I did it because I genuinely cared and I just assessed with my eyes her situation and knew the resources that she might not have been aware of that were available to her. So um, I took that opportunity, I gave it to her and I'm so glad that I did because her and her kids are doing great. Thank you for caring, putting the caring in health care. That's really, really important. For, for um, other panelists who haven't had a chance to speak yet, how do you maintain a work-life balance in um, your demanding field? Um, I think it's it's always a challenge. Um, you know, for us, uh, I take calls well, and uh, we, you know, when you're on call and you have patients that have uh, very acute issues that come up, obviously that's the focus. Um, and obviously, you know, really want to spend time with the family as well. Um, there's no right way to know exactly what's too much and, and what's too little. Um, so you're always kind of reestablishing that boundary. Um, but, you know, making sure, I mean, and we put on courses throughout the year. Um, and fortunately, I think that we have a good uh, symbiosis between the other attendings and we all kind of take turns running those. Uh, so we have, you know, free time and, and really just making sure that I spend that with my family as much as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to, um, in the field of medicine, just make, you know, work your entire life um, and you know that you have to uh, make your family a priority and then also, you know, your own wellness. So getting exercise, uh, making sure that you're eating well and, um, you know, doing all the things to keep yourself as, as um, 
functional and focused as possible because I think you owe it to your patient. So if you're not uh, spending time on your own mental wellness and your own health care, then you're not the best that you can be um, and knowing that that's equally important. So uh, these are always things that I'm uh, keeping in the back of my mind and, and working on, um, but I don't think you ever get it perfectly right. And it's not the same for everyone. Um, you know, one person versus the next person is always going to be different. So. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's a struggle, but it's it's a, a, a great struggle to have to deal with. Uh, right. So for work life balance, I agree with everything that was just said. It can be difficult. You know, it's very important to just stay focused on what's important. You know, stay grounded. Know what's important to you, whatever that is. You know, family, church, uh, community, and support. Uh, system for you, especially when you're early on in training and things can be difficult. And uh, but I think uh, just remembering uh, why you, why you do it and and and, and um, how it makes you feel it's it's kind of gives you that energy to keep going through the tough times. So you know you just you remember why you're doing it, stay the course, take care of yourself as as was said. Um, and uh, yeah, just be honest with yourself. If you know, if you need rest or a break or this or that, if you need help, you know, you can do that. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, it's it can be tricky. But and, and as you said, it's different for everybody. Uh, for me, I like to travel, spend time with my wife and my dog, um, and so I do that as much as I can. Yeah. We have any questions for our physician assistant? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so I have a question for okay. you. Um, what are some common misconceptions about working in healthcare? Oh. Common misconceptions. Um, does anyone know what a physician assistant is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, it's okay if you don't, um, because I didn't know what a physician assistant was. I learned about what a physician assistant was when I was in the Army. Um, I grew up only knowing that there are doctors and nor nurses. Um, so there is a common misconception for physician assistants is I get the question all the time is, when are you going to finish medical school? <laughs> when are you going to be a doctor? My answer is, I'm not going to. I'm happy being a physician assistant. Um, I uh, get to do all very similar things that the, the physicians do, um, but I don't. I didn't have to go to school as long. Um, and the nice thing is, I'm not on call. So <laughs> as far as work-life balance, it's made. It's built in for me. Um, you know. Um, so yeah, that is the most common misconception I think. For what I find out is, I get asked quite frequently is. When are you going to be a doctor? When are you going to finish medical school? What's your typical day like? My typical day is um, I do a combination of a clinic and I do hospital coverage. So when I'm in the hospital, I am, I am first call for um, consults in the hospital or in the emergency room. If a patient comes in for, um, let's say, they for um, what they call atrial fibrillation, it's an abnormal heart rhythm that can cause you to be short of breath, um, you have chest discomfort, and feel fatigued. We get called for um, to see them for management of whether it be to put them back in normal rhythm or do we continue, do we try to just rate control them? And then we also talk about medicines to prevent stroke because of that rhythm. Also, we also manage um, uh, patients who are in congestive heart failure. So those are patients who are retaining fluid and they retain fluid because of their heart is usually weak. Um, and you get short of breath, you get a, a swelling in your legs. Um, but yeah, we get those. And then also we get called for things for chest pain management. That's not, may not clearly be an acute MI or acute heart attack that you can find on a heart tracing. So we get called say, um, we're not real sure if this is due to a blockage in the artery. So we um, kind of give our expert um, um, expertise on on management of those patients. 
Thank you. Um, student group, we have an esteemed panel here who uh, have a variety of experiences in healthcare. Um, I'm going to open it up for your questions now for a few minutes so you can, you know, ask, ask away. We're happy to uh, answer your questions. Again, please state your name in your high school so our panelists can know who you are as well. Hello, my name is Nefemi Akiwande. Um, I go to Thomas Jefferson High School. And my question is directed at Dr. Ngusu. Um, if you can hear me. Yes, you can. Hello. Um, my question was directed at you because I realized that we had a lot in common. We're both born and raised in Nigeria. And I had a lot of questions about um, how you were able to transition into the country because I found it extremely difficult. And also um, shadowing opportunities with you or shadowing opportunities that you know about with the neuroscience field and the neurosurgery field? Sure. Sure, so I'll start with the easier question. Shadow and opportunities are always available. I'm in private practice and, and I'm open to have any of you maybe shadow me. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Pierre can, can put you in contact with me to set that up. Um, the harder part of the question is, is sort of regarding acclimating from the Nigerian environment to the American environment. Um, you know, I mean, everyone's experience is slightly different. Um, and, and mine was was difficult, um, was difficult as well. Um, and I'll give you an example that you may be familiar with. Um, you know, being in junior high school in Nigeria, when you were asked a question, you would have to stand up to answer the question. And you know, I came to high school here and you know, I was asked a question in class and I stood up to answer the question and I got laughed at. Um, so, so those difficulties were certainly there and, and I don't think they're avoidable. Um, you know, I think, you know, they actually help you develop thick skin and grit, which is absolutely, you know, important and valuable through, you know, important and valuable to going through the process of medical school and residency training. Um, so I would say, you know, if, if you are experiencing some of these challenges, um, you know, understand that, that they're temporary and, and that they will pass and use it as fuel um, to, try to, to try to get you to, to that, that next level of, um, of where you're trying to go. Any other questions? We have, yep, we have one here and one here. So oh, hello, my name is Caitlin Lee and I'm from Highline High School. And this question is towards Michelle. I wanted to ask, as someone who is really interested in pediatrics, I love helping kids and I work to teach kids how to swim and I also teach kids how to read. I wanted to ask, what is one advice you would give to someone interested in pediatrics that is interested to pursue, pursue the field? And is there anything you recommend that I do to prepare myself for the field? Wonderful. We all need more pediatricians. So congratulations on that interest. Um, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Uh, the better grades you have, the more opportunities you'll have. So continue your studies. You know, do well. You know, get excellent grades. Um, and you know, it's it's not, you know, magic. I mean, you worked hard for it, right? So once you have good grades, you have um, more opportunities to go to the university that you want to go to. Once you start your university, um, I think the best piece of advice is to uh, find friends that, you know, have your similar study habits. So you can find a study group of friends to kind of, you know, be accountable to one another. Like I mentioned, I have uh, several friends who are pediatricians who I met when I was in college. Um, so that kind of, you know, keeps the, the vision alive. And then when it's time to um, go to medical school, as you're choosing your specialty, you rotate through all of the specialties in medical school. So a lot of people, you know, think they want to be a pediatrician, but they like OBGYN, they like internal medicine, they like surgery, they like psychiatry, they like family medicine, they like anesthesiology, they like dermatology. So I mean, you know, when you have that curiosity, a lot of things are interesting. However, you know, as I mentioned, 
taking care of kids is not just taking care of their health, it's taking care of their education, it's taking care of their nutrition, it's taking care of their environment. So as long as you're interested in things that, you know, affect children, you'll, you'll always, you know, have, um, have an ability to, to be successful in that field. So thank you. Thank you. We have another question here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lila. I'm from Bremerton High School. And um, this kind of is a question for any of you guys, um, but what are some of the challenges when trying to provide health care to people? Like daily, what do you have to deal with and how do you like, what are some of the challenges when you try and provide people with not just mental but physical health and what do you see and what do you deal with? And like, what does it look like for you? What are your challenges? That's a really uh, very good question. Um, so challenges uh, in general, um, so, you know, there's challenges within yourself and then without, you know, there's things that can happen outside. You can be very busy, you know, then that can sometimes, uh, you might not see your family uh, sometimes, if, if, you know, that, so that can be challenging with that balance with your family. Um, and then just managing, uh, the stress when it comes, um, but uh, luckily, you know, the all that stuff is f usually outweighed by the be the benefits and, and uh, the the things that make those challenges worth it. Yeah, um, but they 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 will come, no matter if you do medicine or not. Life, you know, you may have all types of plans for your life, but life will bring challenges to you, no matter what you do. Um, so. But yeah, you just have to be aware of that and be honest with yourself um, and ask questions and get to know the field uh, that you're interested in uh, to know whether those challenges are even something that, you know, makes sense for you. Um, for me, uh, some of the cha I have two spectrums of that. Um, one is you often encounter, especially when I was in the hospital setting, um, the family. Sometimes the family can be very challenging, um, especially when they are not um, accepting what their family member wants. So if somebody doesn't want end of life services to be performed, but the family wants them to be resuscitated, you find that conflict a lot. Um, and in those situations, you follow the patient's wishes. Even though the family will be upset, if they're coherent and they have the documentation for it, you have to follow what their wishes are. Um, the other spectrum for me is that because of how I present, I am often looked at as I don't have enough knowledge to be sitting in this chair um, teaching. Um, and my road to my doctorate was not simple. It was not easy. I had kids. Um, so I often was working with people who did not have that same struggle where you had to work, you had to go to school, you had to do this and that. Um, and so, especially in the nursing world where I'm teaching nursing students, I'll come in the room because, you know, they don't know you until you walk in and then they see me. And then I get this, and then I get the other stairs like, Okay, and then you get the little subtle whispers to the partner next to you, like, oh, you know, but for me, that just gives me more, um, I don't know, I just kind of, when I see those type of things, or I hear it, or I, present, I get presented with those type of situations, it just gives me fuel um, and confidence, because it lets me know, like, hey, I'm in this seat, yep, I can do this, and just because you think I can't, I'm going to show you even more that I can. You know, and so you, you'll face things. Um, unfortunately, in my world, the nursing world, you do have nursing bullies. Um, they are terrible um, because they think you're going to take their job. And half of them, you've been working longer than you've been alive. You will never take their job. But they do feel that way. Um, and so just stand your ground. Um, don't allow anybody to run over you. Um, you are in that seat for a reason. You were placed there for a reason. And as long as you remember that, whatever comes your way, it's just going to be a hurdle that you're going to keep jumping over. Melissa? Yeah. And just to piggyback on that, like I know exactly where you're coming from. As an occupational therapist, I walk into the room and a lot of times I get a second glance or questions like, are you 
are you here with housekeeping? Are you a CNA? Are you something else? And then comes the gusts that you have to have to like, dem like uh, manifest and show that you are knowledgeable. You know, somebody comes in with some type of surgery and they're like, I just had that done. Do you know what that is? And so there's just this constant battle to try to like prove that you deserve to be there. But just like you said, stand your ground. You did everything you needed to do to get to where you are. You are not less than. Uh, the other layer for me is that I need to, I have to do a, a check in with myself and recognize that the person that I'm going in to work with has an entire life of experiences that have made them the way they are. So maybe they are extremely rude or dismissive or, you know, behavioral in some kind of way, shape or form. I don't really know their background. So I think one skill that would be worth having is trying to really diverse, uh, <laughs> I'm losing the word, tailor how you're going to intervene with each person. Like the way I communicate with you isn't going to be the way I communicate with you. So some person might not be particularly motivated and respond well to like a firm tone, direct attitude, like we're getting up, we're doing this, let's go. And somebody else might need a little bit more coddling, a little bit more sensitivity, a little bit more like inspiration, encouragement, and things like that. So you just you can't have the same approach with everybody. And so you just have to go in a little blind, get the feedback from their whatever their personality is, especially if you're going to be with this person for, I know nursing, you'd be with them for 12 hours. You know, you're not just in and out. I'm, I might have somebody on my caseload for three weeks, and they are just uh, really really stubborn person. So you just have to kind of work with it and find out what's going to work best with them and find a buy-in. If you find out what they like, you, you can win every time. If it's music, if it's a chocolate pudding cup, if it's what are they like talking about their children, if they're demented and all they can think about, all they talk about is like, oh, this childhood memory, keep bringing that up, whatever it takes to get them to, you know, that sounds manipulative, but whatever it takes to get them to do what you want them to do to help them. That's it. One, one last question from the, okay. Uh, hello. What's your name? Uh, my name is Daisy. I go to Mount Rainier High School. Um, my question's for Dr. William. <laughs> I feel like uh, a lot of people, when I talk to them about the medical field, they talk about for undergrad majoring in biology or chemistry. So I was just wondering how come you ended up majoring in chemical engineering and how did that relate to you wanting to go into the medical field? Okay, yeah, um, so, um, wait, so chemical engineering was, so my father's a doctor, so that's one thing. I did not always think I wanted to do that, but um, I didn't, I actually almost knew I didn't want to do that, uh, uh, watching how hard he worked, but uh, then I went to school and I was undecided for a year because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, Right, no, so, no, back up. But when I first got there, I went to try to find a major, and I didn't, like I said, I didn't think I would go to med school, so I thought I'd have to do a major that would allow me to have a career if I didn't go to med school. So uh, I went to the engineering school, and uh, <laughs> I was a little bit of a late bloomer, academically. Uh, so uh, you should also know that sometimes, you, you know, you don't, get the best grades, but there are still paths for you. Don't let that kind of stuff stop you. But I got there and I said, oh, this engineering, this looks great. And for whatever reason, I just wanted to do the most difficult things. I don't know why. And so, and then I looked at this chemical, oh, this looks hard. So I just, I, and I said, oh, how about this one? They told me, no, you, you, cannot be a, you cannot do chemical engineering when I first got there. So I said, okay. And sometimes that happens in life. Somebody tells you you can't do something and that boosts your motivation. So I said, okay, I, I did undecided for a year to get better grades. And then I went back uh, and then they said, oh, you're back. And I said, that's right, chemical engineering. Said, okay, here you go. Um, <clears throat> that's very hard. <laughs> and it was, it was very, very difficult, but I did the pre-med track. And for me, the pre-med classes were it wasn't even close. They were more enjoyable. I, I enjoyed taking those classes compared to the engineering. The engineering stuff is amazing, and those people are amazing, and you need that, but it wasn't for me, so I knew I wasn't going to do that. I did internships in chemical engineering, and I just 
did not want to do that. And so I had this pre-med uh, track. I had good grades in pre-med. And honestly, I didn't really know what else to do. I knew I loved this. I, I knew in high school my favorite class was woodshop. And I like to use my hands and power tools. Uh, and, and I love helping people. So I said, let's go to, let's go to med school and put those things together. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, we have one more. Yep. State your name. Um, my name is Samaya, and I'm from Garfield, and I got a question for Dr. Rhodes. <laughs> when you were young, did you see yourself being in the nursing-like um, like facility? Um, to be honest, I, was, uh, I wanted to be a pediatrician, <laughs> but um, when I got to Clark Atlanta University, um, my cousin, who is a pedi pediatrician, um, was across the way at Spelman. And she had this class that was mentioned earlier called organic chemistry. <laughs> she's extremely smart. And so I'm like, hmm, if she's over here struggling with that class and she's smarter than me, uh, maybe this bio, bio pre-med is not for me. Um, and I wasn't a fan of just general chemistry per se, because I was sitting in the class wondering like, why do I need to know the symbol for silver and gold? Why do I need to know that? I'm not gonna use this. And some of it I actually used because just for K, that means potassium in nursing. So for me, I switched gears um, and I'm so glad I did. Nothing against the MDs because my cousin, my my cousin is fantastic. She is one of the top pediatricians in Ohio. So um, I just found that I that this was my calling. Like I felt more at home when I started taking nursing schools. The minute I walked into Ursuline College and stepped in that room, I was like, this is for me. And um, I just continued on. When I got, said I was going to be done because the NCLEX was horrible, um, but I survived it and then went on to get my master's, dual master's degree, thought I was gonna be done, and decided to go back and get my doctorate. So I still am called a doctor, um, but I'm not an MD, but I am so glad I did what I did. I always had the desire to care for people, um, but I found out when I went to college that this was my better path. So that's how I landed. Uh, I'm a late student in the front. Oh. No, there was the, the, one the, the back no, no, the one that asked the question originally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say one thing about your question again. Um, you can you can major pretty much in anything you want in college and still go to med school. You just have to do pre med classes. By the way, so people do English, music. You can do as long as you have the pre med classes. That's okay. You should do what interests you, and then go with that. I think uh, there's one last one. We will, just, just to add yeah, on that, I was yeah. an art history major, so oh, there's great. nothing that stops you from going to med school. I went back and did my pre-med after I had already graduated. So, um, you know, there are many paths to this career, and, uh, you know, you may not decide that you're interested until later in life, and, and that there's still nothing that's going to stop you. So, Excellent. I think there's one student we haven't heard from. We'll let her go, and then we'll uh, thank our physicians and um, radiation technologists, PA, you know, Dr. Rhodes and uh, Melissa, occupational therapist. Um, hello, my name is Alfreda Belle, and I'm from Highline High School. And my question is for Dr. Williams. Um, I'm from Ethiopia, and I've always wanted to go back and like do some research there at some point. And I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate more on your experience while like while working in Ethiopia. Yes, yes. One of the, my favorite things I've done. I've gone twice. I'm going to go later this year. I, I used to work in Portland, and uh, one of my partners uh, uh, fixed a hip on, some, on, a, on a woman that had a hip fracture. Her son uh, was, is a physician in LA from Ethiopia. And so with that connection, my, my partner, who's a, who, my former partner, who's actually a spine surgeon in orthopedics, started to go to Ethiopia because he had the connection with this, this patient's son and to that hospital because that 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 doctor her, her 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 son has a hospital in ethiopia in a place called negele arce it's three hours south of addis ababa which is the capital for for you and um so 
I, you know, he asked me for many years to go and I was kind of worried. I had never been to Africa. It seemed kind of stressful and, and all that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I just, I've always been interested in helping people. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go. And I went, very long flight, 17 hours. I mean, very, very, just the trip alone, right? And then you get there and uh, you said, you, you said you've been there or ne never? You were born there, but you, do you remember? Okay. So, uh, you know, the people there were just so appreciative because there they don't have a lot of people to do hip replacements. And some people, you know, they might do a handful in a year in the whole country or something like that. You know, it's very limited resources. So we go there and some people might come from so many kilometers away, you know, and there, here we have it so, so, so good. There, you know, you might have a bad hip, you can't walk, they give you a stick and that's it. You know, you don't get medicated, nothing. So they were very thankful that we went there to help and they would come from far away and they just, you know, we, we did those surgeries and they did, they did really well. Those people are, like I said, so appreciative and, and they're, they're, they're tough, I'll tell you that. They're, they're different, very tough. You know, if they get Tylenol after a surgery and they say, thank you for that. You know, if you hear people are gonna want their, medic, their strong medications and, and they, they're so used to having it good i think that they forget that they have it good and they have these expectations sometimes that you just wish that they could go to ethiopia and see how it, how it could be so that maybe they could appreciate more what we have here but it just opened my eyes to that so i i you know I, i'm so um so glad as soon as you started to speak i was like i was like is, because I, I know now i'm like looking for people like in the nurses in the hospital i'm like oh are you from ethiopia and i start to talk to them about it and they're just excited that i went you know, it's, it's, I can't even describe it to you. It's, it's, it's the best and your, your people are amazing. Yes, well, thank you. Let's thank our panelists. So, so um, uh, we're gonna have a lab and then afterwards we're gonna have what we call a networking power lunch. Uh, ben, you, you, you okay if I show some slides here? So we're going to have a networking power lunch. The, the idea and the goal is for the panelists that are able to stick around, we're going to split up essentially all the students into small groups of about five to six with, you know, one of the panelists. Uh, we'll use all of SSF. So we'll have a couple groups in here, some in the front conference room, dining room, as well as the library. So you can eat your lunch and interact with the um, panelists one on one and ask some more questions and they can, you know, kind of ask you questions as well, get to know you. Um, Dr. Ian Wolfson, we had to jump off, but he is okay, and I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the other panelists are okay with me sharing your emails, just in case the students want to reach out for shadowing or questions, uh, you know, and uh, just as Dr. Tolbert had mentioned, you know, creating a community of champions and mentors. So I'm hopeful if you guys are able uh, to freely give your emails out to the students. Okay, so let's thank the panelists again. Now, now, uh, uh, Ben, we're going to transition to the lab. So, uh, uh, Dr. Gertzmeyer, are you ready for us? Start right away. Okay, so we're going to showcase just the basic anatomy okay. of a patient. So Dr. This is Dr. Gertzmeyer and our hey. um, uh, uh, research intern, Ziad, uh, who's going to be starting at Wake Forest. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Gersmeyer, take it away. All right, thanks. Liv. Um, just introduce myself. I'm Dr. Gasmeyer. I'm a, a trauma specialist from Germany. I'm doing my a research fellowship here, and um, I have Ziad here, and he will um, showcase um, the anatomy for you guys. Okay, so we're just going to start at the top. So just for basic orientation, uh, can you see? Yeah, there we go. Um, so over here is the head. Just my head is up here, and then down here are the legs, and then this is the left side of the body, and this is the right side of the body over here. Okay, so just for starters, right here, where I'm holding right here, this is the heart. And we've actually uh, dissected some of the connections, so we're gonna remove it in a second just to show you uh, the basic chambers and valves of the heart. We can actually do that right now, yeah. All right, so we can come back to this in a minute. Yeah. All right, so right here, where I'm holding right here, it's kind of a rough, rigid, ribbed structure. That's actually your trachea. So that's when you're breathing in oxygen, you're gonna take in the oxygen through the trachea and that's gonna enter the lungs, um, which are on both sides and, and here. Um, and it's gonna enter the lungs and there's gonna be a gas exchange there. 
So blood that comes from the heart to the lungs, there's gonna be a gas exchange. That blood is actually deoxygenated, which means it doesn't have oxygen. And the oxygen that you breathe in through your trachea is gonna enter the lungs. And at the alveoli, there's gonna be this gas exchange to oxygenate the blood. And then that blood circulates back, goes into the heart again through the left side. And then that blood's gonna be pumped to the rest of your body. So we can actually go through the heart. Um, should we just, yeah, let's do this. I can, okay, cool. So right here, you're gonna look at the heart. You're gonna see these kind of uh, darker patches right here. So these are your chambers. So if, if I were to hold this here, okay. That's gonna be your right atrium right here, your right ventricle. And that blood's gonna be pumped through the pulmonary artery, which, can you visualize it? It's on the other side. On this, yeah. You can see it from the other side. So this is actually our order, which is the main artery of the body. You already cut it open. We'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. And on the other side, if we flip it, we'll have the vessels which go to the, to the lung right here. We've already cut that one open as well. Yeah. We've already done some dissections just to show you guys the other structures in the body and then some of the, um, if you were to do a cross, that cross section of the actual heart. Um, right. And then the aorta, like Dr. Gersmeyer mentioned, this is the artery. It's the largest artery in your body. It's going to pump blood throughout the whole, to, to all your, your lower limbs, your arms, everything. So it's going to bifurcate, which means it separates uh, into different channels. And we'll showcase actually one of the channels that you can see in the body. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, here. Okay. That's good. Now we can show the cross section a little bit. Yeah, so what we did here is we cut open the order. And to just give you an idea, um, I'm going to cut through right here. Luckily, we did this before lunch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hope you all guys are feeling good over there. <laughs> and nobody's uh, it's not too rough on anybody. Yeah. Okay, so um, can we have the other pointers? Okay. Um, what we have here, it might be a little hard to see, but this is actually the, the valves of the heart, which... Yeah. Um, separate the heart chambers and separate the, the heart and going into the order, which prohibits blood flowing back into the, to the heart. So it, it helps building up the, the blood pressure. Exactly. So you have four valves. You have on your left side your uh, bicuspid valve, which separates the left and the right. Excuse me. Yeah, your left side, you're going to have bicuspid or mitral valve. That's going to separate your left uh, atrium and left ventricle. And on the right side, you have that same valve, but it's a tricuspid valve, meaning it has three leaflets. Um, and so, and then in between the arteries that pump blood out of the heart, so your aorta and your pulmonary artery, you're gonna have two other vessels in between those and the uh, coinciding ventricles. Uh, and then you can see just, on this side. Okay. So this is just for demonstration again. So we have the atrium here. And then we have the main chamber of the heart, mm -hmm. of the left-sided heart. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as you can see, that this is muscle and it's way thicker than the outside of this. And it's just meaning that the chamber has to work harder. It has to pump lung, uh, blood through the whole body. This is why it's thicker. And the atrium only has to pump blood coming from the lungs into the the main chamber. So this is why we have a little, um, just a smaller muscle. And actually now that's a perfect transition to the lungs. So if we can get back to the, um, to the body cavity. Okay, so I said you have the two lungs on both sides. There's one tucked in here you can't see right now. I'm gonna actually gonna pull this one out. <laughs> is that cool with you, Dr. Pierre? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, it's interesting to see the students' responses. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could see it. All right. So he's taking out the, the lung, just removing it from the thoracic cavity. Go ahead, Z. You got it. Hang on. Okay. So here's your right lung. Now, I can't see the left lung, but something of note is the left lung actually has two lobes versus the right lung has three lobes. Okay, you get your upper, middle, lower lobes. Easily said. Nicely visualized, right? Yeah. And so your left side is going to have two lobes, right? It's not going to have this middle lobe. 
and it's going to be a little smaller in size for the left one. The reason of that is Dr. Grossmeyers was saying the left side of the heart is thicker, a little stronger. It's got to pump through the aorta, which supplies blood to the whole body. So basically, on the left side of your body, your left lung, it can't be as big, basically. It doesn't have as much room. So you only have two lobes, and it's smaller in size, versus this is the bigger one. So, and also the heart being on the left side of the And the heart being on the left, left side, side, so there's, chest, there's not so as much space. Exactly. We don't have as much space, yeah. So, okay. all right. And then, so we can go back to the body cavity. Okay, so this structure right here, this is actually your diaphragm. So this is what allows you to breathe, right? So it's going to push down when your lungs want to expand and inhale, and then it's going to push back up when you're exhaling. Yeah. Um, this is why when you take a really deep breath, your stomach comes out a little bit as well. This is because the organs are being pushed downwards a little bit, which is totally fine. Exactly. And it also acts as a barrier separating the two cavities um, of the um, thoracic and the abdominal. How are we doing so far, Dr. Pierre? Yep, fine. Doing great. Yeah, okay. okay, let's continue. All right, so now if we can, I'm gonna show you the liver. I'm going to have to pull it up just a little bit. It's this structure right here. So it's your largest internal organ. The largest organ of your body is actually your skin, but the largest internal organ is this liver right here. And so this is a, it's a very important uh, organ. It uh, allows you to detoxify any chemicals, toxins that, you, that enter your body. So if you drink alcohol, uh, it helps detoxify your body. Um, it also makes bile, which is going to be secreted into the next structure. Yeah, this is going to be the huge. This is a massive one out there, <laughs> with the, the greenish, um, right with there. the greenish structure right here. That's your gallbladder. So if you've ever heard of gallstones, that's associated with this yeah. organ here. That's actually going to store the bile that the liver makes, and that's going to be secreted by the gallbladder as well. Um, the really fascinating fact about the uh, the liver is that it can actually regenerate itself right. so mm -hmm. when um, you uh, have a liver condition that it's not working anymore for example you had too much alcohol over a way too long period um, we, we that... have minors here they, they don't know about alcohol okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> essentially you can damage your liver permanently and then and some uh, sometimes you would need a, a transplant and you can actually take a part of somebody else's liver and transplant it into another body and it will regenerate itself, which I think is a very fascinating and cool fact. All right. So uh, we talked a little bit about some of the structures. We're going to get to the rest of them, but just for a basic mechanism of digestion, because the next process or the next organ we're going to get to is part of that process. So we start with the mouth, which you can't see here, and then uh, the pharynx, and then it's going to enter the esophagus. I showed you the trachea right here. Ooh, hold on. This structure right here. Behind it is actually the esophagus. Can I have that here. There. Right here. Okay. Yeah. It's so, like a smooth muscle tube, essentially. Exactly. So the esophagus, uh, the trachea is a little harder, more ribbed. The esophagus has smooth muscle that helps churn your food down your throat. So as soon as you, you eat food, you're digesting it in your mouth already. You have something called salivary amylase that's going to help digest, digest some of the carbs. It's going to enter your esophagus, and your esophagus will be called, uh, it's going to have peristaltic waves of contraction, which is smooth muscle that just helps churn the food down your throat. And that's going to enter the next structure, which is your stomach. Now, you can't visualize the stomach as well here just because we cut through it so we can visualize other structures. Um, but all, by the way, all this yellow tissue, that's called adipose tissue. That's just fat. Which is totally normal, by the way. Yeah, totally normal. And it has a function. But yeah. So, yeah, you're just picking it up right there, Julius. That yeah, was, that it is. That's yeah. the stomach. It, there's obviously no contents in the stomach as we speak. Yep. So that's, yeah, stomach, that's going to secrete a bunch of digestive enzymes. That's going to help you digest some of your proteins um, and some of your other nutrients in your stomach. And then that's going to move down towards your small intestines, which is basically all of this. <laughs> so your uh, small intestines are actually, if you were to stretch it out, it's 25 feet in length, which is just insane in my opinion. Um, and this is where all the food will be 
broken down into indi its individual parts and then can right. be reabsorbed um, uh, absorbed into the body. Yeah, I don't want to get too complex, but your small intestine is uh, divided into three subsections. So it's your uh, duodenum, uh, jejunum, and your ileum. And each one has a different uh, role in digesting nutrients and also reabsorbing some water. Um, but your main water reabsorption uh, organ is well, there's kidneys, but also your large intestine, which is down here, right here. Yeah. We moved it a little bit um, oh, yeah, side, it down. but the, sig the sigma, which is also part, you can see it right here. Move back a little bit. Yeah, there we go. So all that, that's your large intestine. Uh, its main job is to reabsorb water into your bloodstream. Um, so it's actually full right now. And then here, right here, this white structure, it's part of your psoas muscle. It is, yeah. It is uh, what helps bending the hip as well. Yeah. You said there's a large vessel right in front of you staring yeah. at it. Yep. Just about to get to it. So here uh, we have two, have, we have two, two large here. vessels, right? That is correct. So <laughs> this one on the right side, we'll start with that. That's part of your inferior vena cava. It is, is your, yeah. That is your inferior vena cava. So that's going to supply when blood uh, is being supplied to the rest of the body. It's also oops, it's being brought back to the heart via the inferior vena cava and also the superior vena cava, which brings back blood from the head and anything above the heart. So anything from the lower extremities and yep. from all the um, abdominal organs that will pull back into this vein and that will be transported all the way, bypassing the liver and will end up um, in, the, uh, in the thoracic cavity, then pooling into the heart. Yep. And then right next to it on the left side, this is, believe it or not, part of the aorta. So that's, mm -hmm. it's the largest artery in your body. And this is part of the, the uh, where it's going to be supplying uh, blood, oxygenated blood to the rest of your body um, in yeah. terms of lower limbs it's and all a, that. It's a Y shaped, um, and uh, being we both legs need fresh yep. oxygenated blood. So right here, um, it splits into two one for the left and one for the right leg. Yep, we call this a bifurcation. So this is going to bifurcate into the iliac arteries that are going to supply to blood to both legs, oxygenated yeah. blood. Um, can we see the kidneys? That's the one thing we haven't gone over. So yeah, on, on Dr. Gersmeyer's side, yeah, right there, um, underneath the towel, or on top of the towel. Where did we put it? Oh, there it is. There she is, okay. So we have... Okay. Can we see that? There we go. Don't worry, he's much more gentler in surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is your left kidney. Right here, kidneys what, are. What kind of shape is it? It's like a bean shape. If yeah, yeah, if you were to bring it out, it's more like a bean shape. We actually, oh, we can pull it out. Yep, right here. So yeah, this is where the beans get their name from. <laughs> so it's not the other way around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that's your left kidney. We'll put her back in there. Um, kidneys are really important for filtering your blood. So you have a lot of toxins. Get it out. Your, say again. Get it out. Okay. We can actually cut it open. Show it. Yeah. And then if you elevate the uh, intestinal components uh, and, um, called cranially, you'll see another structure on the left upper quadrant. Hold on. The spleen, he's talking about the spleen. Yeah. We I'm actually to haven't that mobilized it out. Um, there it is. But uh, yeah, that's the go. spleen. Yeah, so we have the spleen. So I guess, yeah, we'll talk about this before we get to the kidney. The spleen is actually in charge of um, it's, it helps remove uh, some of your blood and si kind of recycle your blood. It also has white blood cells to fight infections. Uh, this is a common organ to get injured in car accidents. You often hear like internal bleeding, the spleen could be bleeding. Um, so yeah, very, very important organ uh, located on the left side. It's uh, kind of tucked behind the uh, stomach. Ziad, um, uh, Dr. Williams is also mentioning another comment. So if, you, uh, if patients present with mono, uh, which is a viral infection, it, it causes uh, issues with your spleen. And so that's another okay. uh, in clinical indication for it. Okay. And so when it's, now Dr. Gersmeyer is cutting through the uh, kidneys. Uh, just a fun fact, so when it's infected, it can get actually really, really large. So you just saw that it's actually a fairly small organ, but it can, under circumstances of diseases, get pretty large, even larger than the liver. Yeah. All right, so I'm just cutting it open so you see how the urine is produced. So this is essentially like your Brita filter at home. 
<laughs> but a little bit smarter. Yeah. So the structure is not too nice, but you can see. So we have blood coming in and going out, um, which is here. I think, yeah, you can just about spot those vessels. I didn't do a yes. handy job in preserving those. I'm sorry about that. We do have a question yeah. from a student. Yeah, yeah any time. Go ahead, Maya. Uh, so when you go like back to the whole thing, the yellow part under what I'm assuming the skin, is that fat or is that something different? That's it is? fat. Yeah. It is, okay. Yeah. It's fat, yes. What's the medical term? Adipose tissue. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so because the kidneys are so important, they are right at the bottom or right in the back, just surrounded by a whole lot of adipose tissue or fat um, to preserve them. And what I wanted to show is um, we have the red structure here, which is the uh, parenchymal uh, tissue of the kidney, essentially the filter. And down here, where it gets a little more yellowish, whitish, um, it's not too nice in this uh, cadaver. But this is where the urine is pulled and then transmitted via the urethra to, to the bladder. Yeah, so it's going to go from the kidneys to the ureters. You have two ureters on both sides. Or sorry, one on each side. Did you dissect it out? Were you able to get the ureters? Your, your we found one. Yep, right I here. see there on the right side. Okay. There it is. Yeah, they're very, very thin. Yep, so that's going to connect to your bladder, which helps store the urine that's produced from the kidney. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was learning about this in, in biology class, the kidney seems so simple, but it is a, the most complex organ. And it's just, yeah. the it goes from like the glomerulus to the Bowman's capsule. There's so many different technical terms. And it's a very a lot and more complex. And it actually does a lot more than just produce your urine. For so sure. Also very important in blood pressure regulation, hormone yeah. regulation. So mm -hmm. although being very, relatively small, um, it has a lot of function. Yeah, so basically there's a ton of nephrons, which are the individual units of the kidney. And in each nephron, you have this whole process happening of water reabsorption and electrolyte balancing and all that. So it helps to maintain your pH, which is supposed to be seven um, in your body. And so that helps to maintain pH, blood pressure, just like Dr. Grossman said. And lastly, you know, we are a spine surgery facility here. Um, we uh, actually, um, in beneath the vessels here, we have a structure that is called the spine. And um, so you see the individual, like a shiny, um, a shiny whitish structure here, which would be the, uh, the ligament in front of the, um, the vertebral column. And what we just did is here, um, we um, opened that up and this is actually the disc space. So the, the disc, we removed some of that um, as we would do if we were to doing a, a fusion surgery. Uh, where we combine two different bones with a the graft or an uh, implant, and uh, this is where the um, vertebral disc would be located at. Got you. So I, I guess I am sorry I failed to mention at the start of the session. This is a cadaver. Uh, so this is a uh, well now formerly deceased human being. Uh, can you tell us the gender by looking at the internal organs? Uh, yes. So. Actually, down here, we didn't touch on that. Um, I have to move a little further down. So, there's, so you, yeah. can tell, you can tell, you know, gender or I would say sex. Let yeah, me so yeah. the sex of the sex patient of this uh, cadaver is, or the sex of the cadaver is uh, female because she does have a, oh, hold on, a uterus. Um, and there's actually, yep, go ahead. You got to pull it up or move it to the right, the, the large intestine, the cecum there. Yeah, it's a little bit oh, uh, there. So, yeah. 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 So, so that's the uterus right there. And right here, you can actually see a little bit of a, a mass. Um, yeah. Now, we don't know if that's benign, if it's cancerous, we have no idea. We don't, we're not Nodule, sure what the, yeah. the patient's, yeah, um, or the cadaver, what she died from. But um, yeah, so that's the uterus right there. Excellent. So that's a, one of your indications. Mm -hmm. Pretty healthy body uh, for the most part. Um, this is not too much fat um, compared to some of the other cadavers right. we've seen. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? All right. I think I think you guys. Wait. Uh, you guys did an excellent job. Thank you, Dr. Gersmeyer. Thank you, Ziad. I'm so. so uh, mm. Uh, ben, if you don't mind, I could show some slides. So again, uh, we are at the 
uh, part of the um, conference where we have our networking power lunch. All of you have your name tags? So ensure that you have your names. So I didn't get a chance to number the name tags, but what we're gonna do is essentially split it up into about uh, seven or eight groups. And uh, these are gonna be the locations for the groups. Um, so uh, what we'll do is we'll release you row by row to get your lunch. And then from there, you will have you relocate to another section within the Seattle Science Foundation. We have our volunteers, Amelie and Angela, that'll help direct us. We ask the panelists that are able to stay, you know, grab some lunch. And then uh, the way it works is we are currently in the large conference room. When you entered, you saw that front room with the sunlight, that's the front conference room. The next two rooms going towards the back is the dining room and then the library. So I'd ask you guys to just split yourselves apart, uh, and uh, sit down with some of the students, have lunch, break bread with them. And then um, at around 12.15, we'll resume to come back here to split into the next sessions. Thank you.
Oh, you want to go to the next one? Okay, go ahead, go ahead.